Reading God's Word, uh, Nehemiah uh, chapter 2, 1 through 20. And it came to pass in the month of Nishan, in the 20th year of King Arxerus, when, uh, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad? Since you are not sick, this is nothing but sorrow of heart. I said, no, I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs lies waste and the gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, How long will you uh, journey? How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah, and, and a letter to Ashva, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the... Sedel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. <clears throat> and the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I went to the governor in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captain, captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Amnite, the official heard of the official heard of it. They were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well being of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and I was there three days, then I arose in the night. I and a few men with me, I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to this uh, serpent well and in the refuge gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. Then I went unto the fountain gate and to the king's pool but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, nor the nobles, nor or the officials, or the others who did the work. Then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to his good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobai, the Ammonite, the official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, they laughed at it and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebuild against the king? So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us, therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right or mem memorial in Jerusalem. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. And let us pray. 
together. Oh yes, our Father, we do thank you that we can be in your house, not just in your house, but a part of your family. As sons and daughters of the King, the Creator, the God of all, and all because of your Son, Jesus Christ. May it be clear in the preaching of the Word that we can do nothing apart from you, and yet there is nothing that cannot be done, cannot be accomplished when it is your power that is upon us. Father, as I was thinking this morning, as the, the seasons, as the days start to heat up outside, may you heat us up inside. Mm-hmm. May you heat us up in this place with a white, hot passion for you to hear your word as your church. And I pray that you help me in my weakness to make clear what needs to be made clear, to be bold to proclaim and address what needs to be addressed. And may the courage of the gospel inspire us all that, Lord, you will prosper our hands as we build your kingdom. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And the church together said, Amen. 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 Well, thank you for standing during the reading of the word. We do that because that is, that is where this message comes from. It doesn't come from Alex Brovant. It never comes from any person except God himself. And so we read the word as a testimony to say this is, this is where everything that's about to happen right now as I begin to preach, is gonna, that's where it's all going to come from. Um, I heard a preacher say that this is the, it establishes the field on which the game is to be played. That this is where we're operating. We're operating in this word, Nehemiah chapter 2, today. With that said, uh, give an illustration by way of introduction. Waiting, waiting is a normal, natural, and necessary element to the function and flourishing of life. For example, we all know that the gestation period of beings and of plants and of animals and insects Waiting is a very important part of that. That that nine to ten months has to pass before a baby can be healthily birthed. Before that, it is is dangerous. Waiting needs to happen. Plants, for them to take root and be able to bear fruit, there needs to be a lot of waiting that is involved. Uh, During COVID, I I got into a lot of bread and pizza and bagel making. Uh, So the dough needs time to rise before it can be properly baked and enjoyed And such is a relevant revelation of the way that God works in our spiritual life. Waiting is a natural, necessary, normal element to the function and flourishing of life with God. Waiting is involved. And this is a relevant theme in Nehemiah chapter 2. So I've titled this text for our time today, The Work of Waiting for a Working God. The Work of Waiting for a Working God. That's the thought I want to express with you this point. But also by way of introduction, before we get into it, I think it'd be good for us to have a further overview um, and review of this book. Jordan did a phenomenal job of beginning this series in chapter one last week. Um, But to just remind us of a few things and to add a few additional thoughts, let's understand the literary genre of Nehemiah, because that's going to help us understand it in its right context. We have just come out of Matthew chapter five through seven, the Sermon on the Mount, which is very much this teaching, uh, very instructional text. Well, this book, Nehemiah, or historically Ezra Nehemiah, is one scroll, is much like the Bible since Genesis. It is a historical narrative genre. You see, history was recorded in the Bible, not in the sense of textbook like, you know, dates, events, times, peoples. There is some of that, but there's a greater function to it. Because history in the Bible is told as a story, not a fictional story, but in the way it is presented to us. It was handed down or oratorically as a story. So what do we learn as humans from stories? We, there's something more to be uh, discerned out of stories. It's more than mere facts. There is contained in this story formed historical account wisdom, revelation. Truth. These things we must be aware of about God and his will, especially in literary genres such as this. 
Also, in this new series, rather than going verse by verse, we're going to go chapter by chapter, which means that there's going to be a lot of details that perhaps we can't cover. We're just going to have to take it, uh, taking greater chunks and greater holes and see the wisdom to be discerned by that. There's wisdom to be discerned both verse by verse and chapter by chapter. To that end, if you do not have a Bible, you're going to want a Bible uh, for this and, and for your life. If you do not have access to a Bible and you'd like one of your own, we will get you a Bible because you're going to need one to follow along in this way. But by way of reminder as well, the time setting of this book is mid 400 century or not century, 400 BC before the life of Jesus, 400 years. And what we know about our Bibles is that between Malachi and Matthew, there is about 400 years between these times. So this would set us chronologically uh, as one of the last written uh, accounts in our Bible. Now, the way our English Bible is ordered is more by genre than by uh, chron- chronology. So, uh, but this is where we're at. It's at the end of the Babylonian exile. More than 70 years they were in exile, and Nehemiah is the third of three waves to return. There's about 100 years of time between the first wave and, and Nehemiah's wave. And he learns news that since the exiles have returned, there is still ruin in Jerusalem. There, the walls haven't been built up. The city is not being restored. And that's when he is, upon learning of the abiding ruin of Jerusalem, he's being burdened to do something about it, as Jordan preached last week. Well, even so, last week we learned that Nehemiah didn't jump straight into the work, right? First he prayed, and we'll see still in Nehemiah 2 that he is yet to build. That's coming in Nehemiah 3. So there's something to be learned there. That between receiving the burden to build and the reality of building, what happens in between? Between Nehemiah 1 and Nehemiah 3, what, what's going on before he actually even does something about what he's burdened on for us? What do we do with our God-bestowed burden? How do we go about, when do we go about acting upon this burden, this burning, this passion that God lays on our hearts to build? What happens in between? So here's the thought I'd like to lay down for us this morning and we'll follow along as we go through Nehemiah 2. Between receiving a burden... And the reality of building is the work of waiting. The work of waiting for a working God. I, have an intention, I intentionally chose this word work for waiting. Because in the sense that we're talking about today, waiting is not a passive thing. It is very much a work. It is something we do. So let's talk about working, the work of waiting for a working God. So if you have your Bibles open in Nehemiah chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8 first. What we learn here is the invocation before the work. Invocation before the work. The word invocation means a a summoning, a a pleading, an imploring of the power of another to come and act. He's invoking somebody else's authority. And so here we have Nehemiah's conversation with the king of Persia, Artaxerxes. An invocation before the work can be carried out. And this preliminary conversation is important for us to see between Artaxerxes and Nehemiah because it was integral to the work being possible. It was was the the thing that set off the, the possibility for the work. And so it will be for us an invocation, but in a different and a more important sense. Well, firstly, in verse one, you see there that this happened in the month of Nisan or Nishan. Um, and verse 1 of chapter 1 says that begins the month of Chislev. So what's the time difference here? Well, scholars would say that there's about four months that happens at most between verse 1 of chapter 1 and verse 1 of chapter 2. Now this introduces a problem. What has he been doing for four months? I thought he was burdened for this. I thought he, had, he, was, he was wanting to do something. What has he been doing for four months? Did he give up? Did he lose interest? Was it just an emotional response at first that wore off later? He said, well, I don't really feel the need to do anything about it. No, it's not that important. I was just emotional at the time. Why had he not yet gone back to Jerusalem to do the thing that he was burdened to do? What happens between burden and building? Well, first of all, we know realistically why he has not gone to Jerusalem Jerusalem yet. 
In the rest of verse 1, we read that he was before the king. When wine was before him, he took up the wine and gave it to the king. In verse 11 of chapter 1, says that he was a cupbearer to the king. So he had a responsibility. His, his life, his time, his responsibilities were not his own. He couldn't just uproot his life and go. That was not his choice to make. And two, we know what he's been doing since. We know he has not been doing nothing. Verse 4 of chapter 1 that when he heard these words, he sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. What we need to see, not just in chapter one, but throughout the rest of the book, is the, we need to see beneath the text the implicit, ongoing, faith, faithful life and practice of prayer. That beneath all of this, that he didn't just pray once and then you know, now he's done his prayer thing and now he's going to go on to rest. No, beneath it all is his ongoing faithful life of prayer. That he has been doing something for four months. He has been sitting before God and praying. Now, something interesting that we learn in the rest of verse one and into verse two is that he had not been sad in his presence, in the presence of the king. Why, why was that? Well, maybe perhaps that was the expectation laid upon him. That he, he could not be sad. That he needed to create this atmosphere of, of, of joy and peace and and, and pleasure, that it, sadness was an expectation that he, he could not come to the king with. He needs to maintain this level of a facade, a mask on the outside. But also perhaps Nehemiah never had a reason to be sad. He's got a pretty great life, pretty great job. Right? He, he has no really need to need anything or want anything. Why would he be sad in the presence of a king that he gets to be a cupbearer to? But he is sad, and Artaxerxes accurately diagnosed Nehemiah's condition. He said, this is sadness of the heart. You see that in verse 2. You're not sick. This is sadness of the heart. There's something wrong in your heart. Let us understand that this burden is not something that Nehemiah could just brush off. Not something he could just forget not something that he could explain away or set aside. You see, God had brought a burden into Nehemiah's heart. We learned that in, chapter, in verse 12 of chapter 2. And when I arose in the night, a few men with me, I told no one what God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. So God has put this burden on his heart. He's been praying about it for four months, and what we see is that the burning had only grown stronger and overcome him. It is eating him up on the inside. He could not have concealed it any longer. Let's, let's just note a few things by way of application. That a burden is not just an intellectual reality. That faith, that our relationship with God is not just an intellectual reality. Like he heard the news and he was burdened. Upon hearing the news, he was burdened. No, it's not just an intellectual reality. It's an effectual one. It's, it's something of the affections. That true living faith is not just a matter of the head, but that of the heart. That God means to take what he communicates as truth, as his will, as his word, and do something in our hearts, the affections, where we respond to the will of God with our deepest desire and longing for him. That, in turn then moves our hands. Sometimes, if we just act upon the ideas of the mind, it's not truly a matter of right desire. And we go ahead and move with just head knowledge rather than actual love from our heart for God and for others. Also, we may understand here that a burden is not always something that uproots us in a moment. But a burden in its Moving in our hearts is an extended work of God of breaking our hearts for what breaks His. We learn in verse 9 that as Nehemiah's prayer was scripturally founded, as Jordan taught us, in verse 9 he says, quoting scripture, but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. That is the will of God. He wants to bring people from the furthest corners of heaven and redeem them to be his own people. And as we spend time in a relationship with God, he's going to shape our hearts and mold our hearts so that that becomes our burning too. 
to reach people from the farthest ends of the earth and bring them back to be a people for God's own name. He expands our hearts for his burden. The closer we are to God in prayer, the more we will feel what God feels toward the ruin of the world. We understand this because of what Nehemiah, he says to the king. Verse three, and I said to the king, let the king live forever, a respectful address to the king. Why should not my face be sad when the city and the place of my father's graves lies in ruins and in the gates have been destroyed by fire? The word sad there can also be translated evil or bad or treat poorly. Like, why should I not feel this sense of evil and poorness? It's just poor in spirit moment for Nehemiah. The word ruin means dry, waste, or desolate, and destroyed literally means consumed. So he's feeling the weight of evil by describing it as this dry wasteland consumed. He's feeling the weight of how sin and evil have destroyed the world. Do we feel that? Do we have this, as the first two Beatitudes say, are we poor in spirit over our own sin and do we mourn over the remaining sin in our lives and in the world? This is what Nehemiah is feeling it's what God has grown in his heart. I'll talk about that more later. Verse four, the king says, what are you requesting? What, what is it that you want? So I prayed to the God of heaven, he says. You see that in verse four. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Look at this. Nehemiah requests of the king of kings before requesting of the king of Persia. Mm-hmm. His immediate response is not to answer his question, but to go to God. Invoke invoke God before he invokes of this king. That's his response. First of all, he knows there's another authority that he needs to come to first. Now the rest, he answers him in verse 5. Verse 5 and then again uh, later on. But do we notice Nehemiah's language and demeanor toward the king? First of all, in verse 2, we realize that he was very much afraid in his presence. That, that word fear, afraid, is also used to, to talk about the fear of God. That he doesn't just have this cowering feel, but he has this sense of the, the, the weight and the reverence of the atmosphere that he's in. That this man has power. I need to respect that power. And in the end, he, he answers the king by saying, if it pleases the king... And if I have found favor in your sight, that word please is the word for good, the, just the normal word for good, tov, in the Hebrew. And the word for favor is uh, that it may go well with or do good or please you. I kind of paraphrased it in, in my own words like this. King, if you believe it to be good to you, and if you believe it to be good for me, if it pleases you, And if I have found favor in your sight, if it's good to you and if you believe it to be good for me, I'll talk about that in a second. Notice the language, demeanor that he has before the presence of the king. I bet that can teach us something about how we respect those in authority over us, especially in this country. It doesn't mean that Nehemiah liked Artaxerxes as a man. It doesn't mean that he agreed with everything that he did. It, It doesn't mean that he was even, Artaxerxes was even a good guy, right? He had completely taken over this nation, Jerusalem, and these people of Israel. They were slaves to Artaxerxes. He very much probably did not agree with that, but he acknowledged something, that earthly kings are put in power by the king of kings. Verse six through eight, we have a further response from Nehemiah. Interesting to know in verse 6 that the queen was sitting beside him. It's just the truth, the godly truth that our women keep us to our word. Um, I don't know if that's the real sense of why Nehemiah put that in there. But there's a sense of which there was a witness to what the king was then going to agree to, to keep him to his word. And I'm not going to read this, but we learned a few details here. That the king wanted a time frame And that Nehemiah then asked him for letters of permission. 
and for provision. He needed permission across a certain threshold, a certain border, and he needed provision for the work to actually be done. Let us understand that these details were not just things that popped into Nehemiah's mind the moment that the king asked. Rather, these are details that Nehemiah had already given great thought to, how much time he needed, the permissions that he needed to cross a certain threshold, and the amount of uh, provisions that he needed to carry out the work. Let us understand this, that there's a cooperative nature between the work of praying and the work of planning. That to pray is not to not plan. That there's a, there's a cooperative nature, there's a relationship between invocation and preparation. That, it, that praying to the God of heaven is a part of the preparatory work, what we need to do here. We need his wisdom, we need his planning, because above all, God knows what is needed for the work to be done. Let's understand that time and waiting is a part of the work. It's not procrastination. It's not a waste of time to wait between burden and building. But there's a time needed for us to properly know what we need to be able to carry on. I thought of Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. How many years was Jesus on the earth? 33, right? How many years did he actually spend in public display of ministry? Three. Now, when this verse is written, it was around when he was 12 years old when he got left behind in the temple. So not even just the 18 years between him when he was 12 and him when he was 30, but the 30 years, him growing up in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Now, he's the God-man. He's the incarnate son of God. We could say, well, he doesn't really need to grow up in wisdom and in favor with God and man. He's God. Rather, I think it has something to teach us. That the, there is a necessary time, a period of time, a preparatory work that we need before we can have an effective ministry. Amen. A pastor once said that uh, the, the time and private preparation is needed to prepare you for public ministry. And it's not just the church ministry. It's whatever God has planned for you, the works that he has for you that you should walk in them, that he's prepared beforehand, Ephesians 2.10. There is a necessary time of preparation. You think of the, the story of David. When he was facing Goliath, what did he say to, to the king? He said, look, I, when I was a servant to my father as a shepherd, if a lion or a bear ever came after the sheep, I would have to go after it and, and save that, that sheep from the jaws of the lion of the bell. I struck him down and I killed him. This is not the first giant that I faced. But the Lord has been preparing me for this moment. And let us not begrudge the time of preparation it takes to have a successful ministry. Amen. Going on, another application point, I think, to kind of wrap up this portion is that I think, as I meditate on it, I believe that this narrative, verses 1 through 8, paints a picture that is actually one of how our prayer life ought to be shaped. Why do I say this? Well, I'll explain. In verse 1, there's a word that kind of tracks through this. It's the word pene. In verse 1, it's translated before, before him, when I was before him, and in his presence, his presence, pene, same word. Verse 2, he uses it of, why is your face sad, your face pene? And in verse 5, if your servant has found favor in your sight, pene. There's a sense of, the word pene means in the presence of, person to person, face to face, a conversation, a relationship's going on here. And I say that it paints a picture of how our prayer life ought to be shaped because it's also used in verse 4 of chapter 1. I continued fasting and praying before, Pene, the God of heaven, in the presence of, in the sight of, the God of heaven. If this is Nehemiah's demeanor in chapter 2, in the presence of a sovereign, how much more before the sovereign of sovereigns. That if this is to me, if this is attitude in the presence of a king with the visible displays of his grandeur and regal, how much more before the sovereign of sovereigns, the king of kings, the God of gods, we can lose a sense of fear with the familiar sometimes. I've been a Christian for a while, I've been going to church for a while, I've prayed every day. You know, it, it kind of just becomes a a familiar and not a fearful thing to me. 
You remember that? I think of the story of Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the king, the God, God Yahweh, sitting on his throne in the train of his robe, the victories that he has won, the power of his glory, filling the temple. And I thought, woe is me, for I am ruined. He had a vision of God, and it made him fearful in his presence. That same God atoned for his sins and, and sent him and used him for his glory. Think of Mount Sinai, when, when Moses went up on Mount Sinai, and, and the Lord it said, descended as this cloud of smoke and fire and lightning, and the people were fearful. The writer of the Hebrews, he, he, ex- he expounds on this idea, Hebrews chapter 12, for you have not come to what can be touched, a blazing fire in darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and voice of whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the, the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. So this, is your, this is the relationship you have with God. You've not come to what can be touched. You've come to what Moses came to, and he went up into that mountain, and yet each of us can go up that mountain too. Yes. You've come before this fearful reality, and yet, why dwell on that too much? The king himself said, what are you requesting? Inviting Nehemiah's heart to speak freely. He had a relationship with Nehemiah. He was one of his closest uh, protectors and guards because he was the, the cupbearer testing the wine. He trusted Nehemiah, had a relationship with Nehemiah. So he invited him to speak freely. Come, what are you requesting? How much more, our Heavenly Father? Right? Hebrews 12 says, you've not come to what may be touched. Hebrews 4, the same writer says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The same God who is like, you can't come near this God, is like, you can come near to me. What? Is there a contradiction here? No, James also says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I think it just teaches us this, that there needs to be this tension that we keep understanding the character of God, that he's someone that is holy and I am not. He wants me to be holy. And so he makes me able to draw near to him that this is a God I should not be able to come near to, but the grace of God allows me to. And so maybe I should have this demeanor. As James 4.10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord. He will exalt you. That Nehemiah has this attitude to say, look, I know you're inviting me in my, my heart here to speak, but if it pleases the king, look, if I found favor in your side, I'm still going to respect your authority. As we learn in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. As Jesus himself prays, not what I will, but what you will, Father. In other words, God's fiery and yet fatherly throne bids us to humble ourselves and trust him, come near to him. As I paraphrased, if you believe it to be good to you, and if you believe it to be good for me, That's what I want. I'm saying whatever you want, Lord. You know what's good for you, to your glory. You know what's good for me. The providence, that is the wisdom and power of God working in tandem, the all wisdom and all power of God working together, and his goodness and love in Jesus is working in and through us. That's an awesome and adoring reality. And this great reality, as I just said, is important for us to see because as we read in the end, verse 8, the the last sentence of verse 8, and the king granted me what I asked for the good hand of my God was upon me. For, meaning because, that the king answering my request was owing to the providence of God in and through prayer. That his favor... Nehemiah's favor from the king, Artaxerxes, was owing to the favor of the king of kings. 
What did Nehemiah pray in, ver- in chapter one? Oh, let your ear be attentive, O Lord, to your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And he had been praying that for four months. Sp- Charles Spurgeon says that prayer moves the hand that moves the world. That there's not, it's not antithetical to say that God is, has all providence and that we should pray because God uses means in his providence. And his means is first and foremost the prayers of his people. He means for us to be a part and cooperative in the work of his providence. And to that end, he uses means in answering prayer. Before I end this section, it'd be easy to speed past and overlook something, a detail here in chapter 2. That... It was this conversation with the king, King Artaxerxes, that got the ball rolling toward the work. That it it wasn't just, we can easily write write off sometimes things of, oh, that was just a coincidence, that was just a natural phenomenon. But if what it means for God to have providence, and that he is all governing, all sustaining, and all creating God, that he, in his province, is using means. He created a physical world. He means to use his physical world in his works of providence. God is at work in a million ways to fulfill his plans. Therefore, we need to stay alert and awake in prayer as he uses prayer to his providence and answers prayer in means. We need to stay alert and awake to, in prayer to see and respond to the work of God that this was a direct answer to his prayer in verse 11 be easy to look past that and it'd be easy to overlook things in life to say well that's just that was just a coincidence i don't believe in coincidences i'll just say that i believe in the providence of god well with these requests granted nehemiah heads to jerusalem but this is about the work of waiting he is not he's not building yet what is he doing next so verse 9 through 16 is the inspection before the work the inspection before the work Before we get into that, we should always remind ourselves of, especially in our supersonic age of high-speed internet and, you know, cars and whatnot and planes and, like, you can get anything instantly. Something that maybe that would have been a little bit easier to understand in Nehemiah's time than it would in ours, that our relationship with God is a walk. It's a walk. It's not a sprint. It's not a bullet train. It's not a click of a button in a search bar. It's a walk. Therefore, as we seek, as the book of Ephesians says, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Walk in a manner worthy. And to do the good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I think this is important to understand that obedience is about the next right step. Obedience is about the next right step. It's not about jumping ahead in line about skipping a few years, you know, skipping a few grades. With God, it's all about the next right step. Let's let's learn this. Now, between verse 8 and 9, again, easy to look over, a bunch of time passes, right? King granted me what I asked. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the letters. So there has been some time that has passed, time waiting, needing for the letters to be drafted and sealed and then for them to get to their supplies and then for them to actually start the journey and get far enough till they got to the province beyond the river there's been some time that has passed look at this more time waiting now verse 10 we have a foreshadow to the opposition that nehemiah and the people the wave the the, the exiles will face to the work and we'll cover that more extensively in in chapters four and six because it's a little bit more prevalent there but this is, a, this is a great theme in the book of Nehemiah, is that there will be opposition to the work. And what do we need to know is here? Verse 10, look at verse 10, the last sort of phrase there. It displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. What's interesting about this is the word displeased is the same sort of word of Nehemiah's sadness of heart. That he is sad, and Nehemiah is sad about the ruin and these guys are sad about the welfare. What does this have to teach us? That the enemy, our enemy, Satan, hates everything good. 
hates everything righteous, hates everything holy, hates anything godly. Therefore, where the kingdom of God for good advances, the kingdom of darkness will be right there. And that's important for us to understand when we come to this idea of inspection. What do we need to inspect? What do we need to have our eyes open to and before us? This is all part of the work. When we come to another period of waiting in verse 11, he was in Jerusalem and he waited there three days. Three days, what are you doing? Get to the work. You're finally in Jerusalem. Get to the work. Well, no, he's not procrastinating. He's not being lazy. He's not being idle. He's engaging the work of waiting. There's another period of waiting, praying, considering. And we'll come to this a little bit more in verse 16, but in verse 12, it said that he arose by himself with just a few guys with him, told no one, and he went to inspect the wall. This is secrecy, this hidden work going on. And so Nehemiah on his horse, or his camel or donkey, it says his animal under him, goes, and now we're going to talk about this, inspects the wall, inspects the walls. I have a map. Hopefully you can see it all right. So the green line that I drew on PowerPoint, that's where he started and where he came to, and then the red is where he came back and returned. You notice here that that's the only portion of the wall he actually inspected. This small little tip, the southern to eastern tip of Jerusalem, he inspects. And then he comes back and returns. Well, what do we have to learn here in this inspection work? Well, we have to know what we're working with before we can work with it. We have to know what we're working with before we can work with it. That's just wisdom. Jesus offers this idea as he talks about discipleship and about following him, but it's true here as well. In, cha- in Luke chapter 14, he says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all those who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man was, began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not first sit down and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. We have to know what we're working with before we can work with it. Again, this is the cooperative work between praying and planning. Think of it this way. God himself, as the all-governing, all-sustaining, all-creating God, uses means. Yes, he can work without anything and work with nothing, He created the world, ex nihilo, that is out of nothing. But he also formed man from the mud. He used means, and he does use means. God knows what he's working with. And he created us in his image to do the same, to have minds to prayerfully, trustingly, wisely, thoughtfully consider reality, confront reality, examine our environment, to know what we're working with, So we can ask God to help us work with it. I have a personal illustration. For about a month now, we've had an issue in our laundry utility room of, I would go in there randomly and there'd be water, just small puddles of water on the floor. And so I've been trying to call people and work with people. My dad had come over and we're trying to figure out where is all this water coming from? And it was just confusing the whole time because whenever we had an idea, this is where it's coming from. It didn't seem to be coming from that place. And a couple weeks ago, I thought, I fixed the problem. I did it. I found something. It looks like that's the problem. I fixed it. Next day, I think Kate called me or or texted me. and was like, hey, there's water all over the floor, more water. I thought, oh my goodness, where is all this coming from? So I get home that afternoon and I kind of look around me and finally I see the sump pump and the pipe that goes up to, to take the water into the drain line, the check valve with the rubber boot front coast connecting the PVC and the metal pipe. In one of those little rubber connectors, there was this like two inch long slit in it. And so my dad was like, pour some water in the, in the sump pump and see what happens. And it was like an irrigation rig. I mean, it started shooting out and I'm like, there it was. I'm focusing so much on this thing that I think is the problem when I didn't really see what the real problem was. I didn't confront reality as I should have. The problem was not what I thought, but I needed to look somewhere else. 
So we need to know what we're working with before we can work with it properly, and we need God's help to do so. Additionally, you see on that, saw on that map that Nehemiah could only inspect so much of the wall and then devise a plan for the work to be done. We read in the text, actually, in verse 14, that he was going to go on to the fountain gate into the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass, so I had to go back. We can only really see part of God's plan at a time. How much do we want to get the whole thing, the whole picture, so we know what's going to go on, but we can only really see a part of the work, a part of God's will. We can never really see the whole of it. God's providence is not a plan to be a whole picture to be deciphered. It is something to be trusted. It is something to be waited upon. And we can never really see the whole of it. Therefore, we can't attempt to accomplish a work that is not in front of us yet. He could not try to devise a plan for the whole wall because that's not what was in front of him. How often we try to go on to other things and do something else when have you been faithful with what's in front of you? Have you been faithful with what's in front of you? Now, my whole idea for this heading and, and really for this whole sermon comes from that word inspect. The word inspect can also mean wait or hope. It's translated that way in different areas. This is the work of waiting. This is a part of the work of waiting, inspecting, of, of knowing what we know and, and seeing what we're working with as it relates to God's will. Psalm 104, verse 27 says, these all look to you. It's the same word for inspect, sebar, to give them their food in due season. They look to you. They trust in you. They wait for you. Psalm 119, 166. I hope for your salvation. I, I inspect, I wait. I sebar for your salvation, O Lord, and do your commandments. So this work of waiting that is necessary to the work to be carried out properly. If I could give a personal example as I was thinking about Jordan's sermon and what has God burdened my heart with? What, what, is the, what is the thing that God is laying on my heart and burning in me to do for his kingdom? Well, immediately, obviously I give these straight answers, of course, my marriage, my family, my parenting. That comes first, as it should all for us all who are, have that gift and that privilege. That that's gotta be number one burden. And of course, the Lord has made me, by His grace, and an overseer of this church, a pastor, preacher, teacher, uh, lead elder of this church. And that's, that's burden. That's, right, that's what's right in front of me. And it's like, that, that's what I need to lay my heart to. But still I see, what else, Lord, what have you specifically called me to and to do for your kingdom in these contexts, in these ways? And I'll tell you, since, even since I... Uh, graduated from Bethel, there was, there was one professor that was saying, you need, you, need to go, you need to go on to get your master's. I think you, you should go on to get your master's. I think you would be great at that. And yet, I had this desire for higher education. Of course, God has different plans, and I'm glad he did. Um, it's still, that, 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 that burden does not go away. And I'm wondering, God, if, if whenever your time is, when do you want me to do it? Do you even want me to do that? Do you want me to go into higher education? And my, my deliberation is, what would I even study? And in recent days, he's been laying on my heart the ideas of church history and historical theology. And, because the church can often fall into the same ruts and problems because we don't know the history. Mm. We don't know our history. We don't know that we've been here before. We don't know that we've tried these same methods. Rather, God has ordained the same methods, that, that truth does not change. So often the church in America is trying to change it, trying to make it suitable. And he's burning me. He's like, I really take a passion after church history and our church fathers and those who have gone before us and shed literal blood to keep the gospel the gospel before the world. Mm. And so I'm asking God, whether it's 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 35 years, I'm waiting on you, Lord. This is what I want to do if it's what you want me to do. But right now, this is where I'm at, and that's where I'm going to lay my attention and my passion and my efforts and my, and my blood. Mm -hmm. um, let's go on. Because he says something about the officials and those who were to do the work. That he didn't tell them beforehand that he was going to go to do this inspection work. 
But he says, I had not yet told them those who were due who to do the work. And so I want to really direct this to leaders, this word to leaders. First and foremost, for today's relevancy, fathers. Fathers, husbands, parents, business owners, managers. But I'm going to speak to fathers. That it is our duty to know what we're leading those entrusted to us into. We have to know what we're working with before we can work with it. It's our duty to do that work of inspection so that we can lead those under our charge into the right ways. And to know how we're going to do that. To know what we're working with. Of course, under God's leadership. But fathers, husbands, parents, business owners, managers, wherever you find yourself as a leader, it is our duty to know what we're leading those entrusted to us into. To know what we're working with so we can successfully lead them the right way. Because, and then this is what Nehemiah says in verse 17, which we'll expound more in the next heading. He says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. You see that in verse 17. You see the trouble that we're in. The word see carries the same definition as understand or examine or inspect. Look, I've done the inspection work. I've seen what's going on. Now I'm presenting it before you. You see it now, right? I've done the work of seeing so that you can see. And this is the truth that we have to see the trouble before us before we can do anything about it. We have to know what we're working with before we can work with it. We have to see the trouble before us before we can do anything about it. We can't ignore it. We can't sweep it under the rug. We can't deem it irrelevant. And we can't be disheartened by it to keep us from working with it. We have to face it head on. We have to see the trouble and we have to say, this is what we're going into. Often, you know, I think of in times of war, right? The leader of a, of a squad or a company say, you see that? We're going into it. We're going into it. That's the same with us church today. You look outside those doors, you look at the news, you look at the media, you look at the different things that are going on in our world, and I say, you see the trouble we're in? We're going into it. Amen. We're not going to sweep it under the rug. We're not going to deem it irrelevant. We're not going to be disheartened by it. We're going to go right into it because that's our call. The trouble with ourselves, first of all, and the world has to be taken into account. This word trouble means wickedness or evil or depravity. And this is what he sees. As he arose in the night, told no one, he did this personal work, hidden work of examination. Right? Now this relates to our salvation. We... All, each individually, have to see the trouble in ourselves first. That needs to be worked on. That needs to be addressed. We all have a trouble. We all are in the fall, post-fall, totally depraved. We need the work of God to rebuild us, to come into our lives. And thanks be to God, he sent Jesus Christ. In our sanctification, we have to continually see, look, there's things in me. I have to see the trouble. I have to see what need God needs to work on now to make me an honorable vessel, useful to him. Until I see the trouble I'm in, how am I to help anyone else out of their own? We learn this from the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke's version, he says, can a blind man lead a blind man? So how can you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye without seeing the log in your own eye? This is all a part of the work of the kingdom. We have to see the trouble we're in personally and in the world before we can really do anything about it. Similarly, as the church and as a church, we're not free of trouble. We're not free of obstacles within. But until we take a close and careful look at the obstacles before us and in us, and, and work out in this sphere what we need to do to, to get on the right track before we can take a careful look at those obstacles before us and work them out under the authority of the word and the spirit of Jesus, we cannot succeed. We have to take the trouble before us head on. But sort of in a broader sense, this really relates to us in, in the matter of the so-called pride month. Do you see the trouble before us? Oh before our families, before our nation, before our our children. And it's not a coincidence that the same month that Father's Day is in, that I would make that connection and say, fathers, this is what we have been charged to 
go into, to send our children into. To know what we're working with so we can work with it. To properly exegete and see the trouble we're in so that we can go in and not in a spirit of condemnation, not in a spirit of damnation, not in a spirit of setting people down and judging, but saying, this is what you've been sent into and charged into to restore, to bring good news, to build up the walls again. That it can be done, but it takes a responsibility of a leader to train up those that we're sending into it so that they won't fall victim to the crossfire. And what we need to see as it relates to the rest of verse 17, and we go into the next heading, is that the trouble Nehemiah wants us to see, to have before us, be aware of, is not his strategy to discourage us, but to encourage us. It's not a part of his strategy so that we would give up, but so that we would get up. It's not to make us cower, but to give us courage. To say, look at the trouble we're in, and I know what God's going to do. Charles Spurgeon, I thought of this as it relates to church history, as I've just mentioned in my own burden. Charles Spurgeon, we, sometimes we take, we take a look at these uh, snapshots of church history and say, what a prosperous time, what a time that God was moving, when really, Charles Spurgeon it could be said that he died because he was so burdened for the church in a dark age that he was fighting for the holiness and the purity of the church in, a, in, a, in an age that was so rejecting of it. And these are the words that he says to us from, from of old, beloved, if it had been possible to destroy the church of God on earth, it would have been destroyed a long time ago. Why? Because this, the church may go through her dark ages, but Christ is with her in the midnight. Let us not be discouraged. Let us not give up. Let us not cower because of our dark age. Because Christ is with his church. We can get up. We can rise up. We can go straight into it knowing that he'll be with us. And that's his his invitation to the work as we go into the next. That is his invitation to the work. He says, you see the trouble we're in, verse 17. Jerusalem rise in ruins, its gates burn. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. We no long, longer suffer derision. How important are walls to the spiritual life as it relates to the will of God? What were those walls for? Well, in a first sense, those walls were to guard, were a protection. It was a fortress. And how this relates to the spiritual life, Psalm 119, a psalm dedicated to, to worshiping the word of God. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my heart, whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Keep me, protect me, keep me in there. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I'm going to guard my life. Proverbs 13, 6 says, Righteousness guards him whose way is blamelessness, blameless, but sin overthrows the wicked. Of course, we know that this trouble, he says, that we're in, and the derision, that is reproach, disgrace, or shame that we're suffering, it's all because of sin. That is at the base of it all. Disobedience to God, forgetfulness of God, a preference to things over God, which God himself warned of. You turn away from me, this is where it's going to lead you. This is a massive theme in the book of Nehemiah as it regards walls and rebuilding. But here we must remember the main trouble, quote unquote, and the ultimate reason for every derision, quote unquote, we suffer is sin. That is, that is the source, that is the base, that is the ultimate reason, that is the main trouble. Might we never forget that the first problem that we face as we go into the, bur- into the, into the building phase, the first obstacle, the first opposing force that we have to face to the good work God has set before us in this world for the glory of God is going to be our own sin. It's going to be the sin of our person. It's going to be the sin of our church. It's going to be the sin of our nation. That's always going to be where the trouble comes from. And therefore... The main and ultimate objective of all our unique burdens, wherever God is sending us as we 
come out of this place and come in. In submission to God's heart, as he conforms it to his, is to restore lost souls, to build a kingdom of redeemed people by the gospel to live for the glory of God. This is the trouble and solution we must start with. Otherwise, we will always only be dealing with secondary problems and solutions. Amen. I'll always be trying to fix that furnace when it was the fern co that was the problem. We have to know exactly what we're dealing with, the exact problem that is at the base of them all it never changes and therefore the great solution is the gospel and the way of Jesus as the word of God presents it to us the walls we must have it is not a, a wall of excluding and impressing people out and a wall of hostility rather the walls are the pure truth the doctrine, the wisdom, the right way of seeing and living, which are built out of the word. That way of living guards us. It protects us. It actually secures us. And it actually frees us to live in the way that God created us to and keeps us in the will of God. And here's the encouragement that we must never forget in the work of waiting. We are waiting for a working God. We are waiting for a working God. In the, both the positive in negative senses or sides, as, as Nehemiah seeks to encourage those who were to do the work, and as those who hated the welfare that they were seeking, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Jeshem, they jeered at us and despised us, saying, What is this thing that you're doing? You're rebelling against the king. Now, the world will always think, This is what you're after. This is what you're doing. This is how you're being uh, hateful and against love and against all this. And it's like, no, 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 you've got it all backwards. We're not rebelling against the king. We are trying to follow the king, the king. So I'm getting off track here. In both the positive and negative sides, as he's trying to encourage and trying to correct, we must never forget this ultimate factor in verse 18 and 20. Verse 18, he says, and I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. And in verse 20, he says, Then I reply to them, to the opposition, The God of heaven will make us prosper. And this factor, this ultimate factor, is the inspiration to the invitation. Right? What did, what, how do they respond? Verse 18 and 20. Verse 18, I told them the hand, good hand of my God had been upon me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the work. That was a response to the good of hand. And verse 20, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we, his servants, will arise and build. Some translations say, and we, therefore, his disciples will arise and build. Because the God of heaven will make us prosper, we will build. In other words, the point is that this inspiration is in response to the reality of God's providence. When you know that your God is over all things, there is nothing you can be discouraged from doing and being faithful in. It's this. It is the strength of God's hand that strengthens ours. Oh, you didn't catch that one. Come on. We're coming to the end here. You've got to finish strong. It is the strength of God's hand that strengthens ours, that strengthens yours, that strengthens mine. It is the strength of our God's hand. It is a commitment to God's work that ensures the success of ours. Verse 20, the God of heaven will make us prosper. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. It's as good as done because our God will accomplish his will. Amen. And strength is required for the work. And that strength is derived from another. I had a quote here, or a verse here from Joshua. I'm going to skip that. But a quote from David Mathis, the, the blue quote, looking to reality beyond this world, frees us from this present age to be able to step out and do genuine good. When we look to reality beyond this world, when we are strengthened by God's hand, then we are strengthened to step out and do good and to carry out his kingdom. This word strength in the New Testament. Ephesians 6.10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 2 Timothy 1, 2, chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 4, verse 20 to 21. No unbelief made him waver, that's Abraham, 
concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And a verse that really gives the backbone and the foundation to this whole sermon is Isaiah 64, verse 4. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for him. What is this work of waiting all about? It's about ensuring our will is in union with God's will. As we give ourselves the work, it's going to ensure that we're not trying to run ahead and do our own thing. But we're waiting upon God, asking him to do his thing. Ask him to use us to do his thing. So as we move into the building phase, remembering, again, always to be retreating back into union and reunion with God daily, as we move into the building phase, waiting and building, we are submitting to, trusting in, and working out God's will. That's the work of waiting. Now, before I close, I thank you for sticking with me and heeding the word of the Lord this morning. I wanted to make it a point of ending with an all-important reality. Remember, it's God's kingdom we are building. In the, in the multiplicity of ways that it takes shape, as God is a multi, uh, the wisdom of God is multifaceted, it's God's kill, kingdom we are all contributing to. That it's God's work that we're building. It's God's burden we're submitting to and is filling us. As Jordan made a point last week to emphasize with us that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only rescuer. That, that you and I are not the rescuer of the world. That the church is not the rescuer of the world. That, that no Christian para organization, whatever, is the savior of the world. It is Jesus Christ that is the savior of the world. It is his kingdom he wants us to be a part of building. And so it's him that we ultimately need. You and I could perhaps or perhaps not fulfill our mission, our burden, our ministry. Perhaps we will. And yet the kingdom is still right now and not yet until Jesus returns because that's the ultimate work. We could finish ours, but the ultimate work we're contributing to is not yet. As the writer of the Hebrews speaks of the Christians who all had faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, he says that all these died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland, if they had not been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, or if they had been, they would, not have, they would have had opportunity to return. In other words, if they had just been thinking, thinking about this land, that's all they, they'll be trapped to. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. The gospel of Jesus Christ, church, is our ultimate inspiration to the invitation as the certain solution to every prevailing problem. This is the trouble before us, you see. They had 400 years until Jesus would come, and yet their faith in the Messiah to come saved and empowered the work in the face of the trouble before him. And you and me, I hope we all see it, the trouble that is before us. Don't ignore it. Don't sweep it under the rug. Don't try to live in spite of it. No, we're going head on into it. You see the trouble before us. Our own sin that keeps us weak in the evil insanity of our world. Jesus, the Messiah, who has come, has conquered it all. He came into Jerusalem for, three day, well, for more than three days, but in three days, he died and then he rose again. Rose triumphant and is seated at the right hand of the Father with all glory, all majesty, all power in his good hand for the, our good and God's glory. You see, our waiting in prayer as a part of the work, not only burdens us more, but emboldens us more as we steep in the power and the promise of the gospel to succeed. You see, this Jesus, this Christ, this Lord, this Savior, this Creator, this God, this sustainer of all things, said, you see the trouble before you. My gospel has conquered it all. You see the depravity. You see the evil. You see the insanity. You see the great work that seems impossible in front of you. Don't look at the trouble. Look at my good hand. Look at my hand that will conquer it all, that has conquered it all. Join me now. Come. 
Let us build my kingdom. Trust me. My pleasure, my favor is upon you. My power is upon you for good. And I will make you prosper when you pour yourself out for me. My kingdom will come. My will is certain to be accomplished. That's what Nehemiah 2 has to teach us. We need to know what we're going to work with. Seeing the trouble before us is not to discourage us. It is to encourage us. Because our God will prosper us. And therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. May God grow in us an undying passion and an unwavering confidence as we await the kingdom of our heavenly Father and our reigning Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, who are your church and your children, see the trouble we are in. Not only do we take the time and confession and reflection to say, God, I was lost and now I'm found. That the greatest trouble we've ever faced and the greatest solution ever presented was our sin and our Savior who died for it. Therefore, there is nothing, nothing that can keep us from experiencing your power to build your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, as fathers, we can often be troubled, not just by the weight of the trouble in the world, but by the weight of our own inadequacy. We can feel weak. We can feel foolish. We can feel like, how could I ever be a good father? We can because of you, our good father, who fathers us, who exemplifies for us, Lord, help us in the midst of our world to not be disheartened, but to take heart because of you, your good hand that has been upon fathers and spiritual fathers in this place and upon church history in the past. Lord, you have shown yourself faithful. May we, may we believe it, trust you. I pray a blessing over every father and spiritual father in this place. For every man in this place that feels like, how could I ever be a father? How could I ever be a spiritual influence for the gospel? I pray you endow them with a sense of call and of worth in Jesus Christ, of a sense of gifting and a sense of empowerment to the spirit of God, that each and every man in here would rise up to be the man you've called us to be whether it's in a home or it's in your home, the church, in the world, wherever we are, we have a part to play, to rise up, to see the trouble before us and invite people under our wing to say, come, let us build. So Lord, will you empower us? Will you send us? Will you glorify yourself? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Will you rise uh, with me and receive a blessing from the Lord? is from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, dominion, majesty, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen and amen. Happy Father's Day, spiritual Father's Day, not done yet. May you have a great afternoon.